joining me again. It's the Yamaha FG230 12-string guitar. It was made in Taiwan. 1972. Serial number 21108421. And I've been told by my friends over at the Yamaha Vintage FG Acoustic Guitars website that... Uh, the very first number in the serial number is the year, followed by the month and the date. So 2 means it was made in 72, 1-1, one, one, November, 08, 8th of November. And then the 421 was, I guess, the instrument, 421st instrument of the day? I'm guessing. It doesn't matter. So neck resets on these things are pretty much, urban legend says that you can't do it. Although, some of us have done it. So, what's up with that? This one has the red label. Uh, the other Yamaha six-string guitar that I did a neck reset on was a FG331. And it had an oval tan label. And it was from Taiwan. And it was uh, from later in the 70s, maybe even 1980. I'm going to say 79 or 80. So, check this out. I have already removed the pickguard, which I've stuck onto this piece of mylar. And it was glued on with, with contact cement, that rubbery stuff. It took a lot of heat and a lot of patience to get that off. But I used my old friend, the you know, clothing iron, and this little spatula right here. I would hold this up against the, the iron, get it hot, and then start working it in. The other thing I realized that worked really good was acetone, but it's the same solvent that dissolves this plastic, so it wasn't a safe bet using acetone. And I've removed the bridge, which has been shaved down to paper thin, and started making a new one. I've uh, used uh, Indian rosewood, and I've basically moved the holes a little bit forward, maybe a one millimeter, because the bridge plate inside here, on the inside of the guitar, it ends right about here, right in front of these pinholes. So these are sitting on the bridge plate, but these weren't. So I already started filling these. I'm gonna put a maple cap over it and re-drill them, but I thought it would be nice to move these, <clears throat> these holes a little further forward to give the treble strings a little more break angle over the saddle. So that there's about the only evidence you need to know that it's made in Taiwan. The Vintage Yamaha website has a story about this exact model. And so there's the red label, which was the first run of Taiwan Yamahas. And then it goes to a tan label, like later in the 70s. And then at the very late 70s, maybe into the 80s, they had an oval tan label. And the oval tan label says right on it, Made in Taiwan, Republic of China. But uh, I have another FG over here right now, a beautiful sounding guitar that was made in China. I don't know what year it is. But uh, there's a story on the Vintage Yamaha website about pulling necks on, gosh, he must have 40 or so different Yamaha stories with pictures. And he goes through the whole thing and he steams them off and he has a lot of trouble sometimes. Well, this old iron is pretty hot. You take a blade and get it really hot. I'll take it right over to this polyurethane and start slicing through it, hopefully. I think the first Yamaha I did, I did it with the Dremel. It was thicker than this. And I just, I was like, screw it. I'm just going to Dremel this stuff off of here. So is it worth the trouble? That seems to be the conversation nowadays about these old Yamahas. Uh, no, if the neck is completely, you know, warped and bowed, or the truss rot, rot, nut is non-functional, maybe it's not worth it. But if the neck is nice, frets are good, and you can get this truss rod to hold, I say yes. If everything else on the guitar is satisfactory, it just needs a neck reset, I'd say yes, it's worth it. You know, and then 
people, when they say, is it worth it? They're talking about, you know, is it worth the money? And, you know, can the customer afford to pay the bill? And I really don't think that's anyone's business what the customer wants to spend his money doing with his own money. If he has a thousand dollars to spend, that's his money. And if you want to talk about other people's money, go ahead. So this one had this nut on it and it really was. Once it goes down in there against the washer, the washer's back here somewhere. You had, there was nothing left to grab onto with the Allen wrench. So what I did, it's a regular 5 16 truss rod wrench. Um, what I did was I bored out a little bit of that material and I used the truss rod rescue. They have a, a variety of washers and I used a thinner one, but I put it right over top of the existing washer and it allowed me to um, be able to grab onto the truss rod nut. And it worked out pretty good. And the neck ends up being quite straight when it's all said and done. Grace DeMarin did a neck reset on a Yamaha FG230, but the one she did was probably from the 60s, and it was made in Japan. Nippon Gaki had a different label. It had a red label, but it said Nippon Gaki right on it. And uh, so, if you take a, a nice, fresh, sharp exacto blade and you um, heat it up on the iron you should be able to make a nice score line right around the edges uh, this one doesn't seem to have much built up around this edge so there's no reason to go crazy around here so usually I end up trimming about 30 thousandths of an inch um, away from the heel as I'm resetting the angle of the neck and um, this is an 18 thousandths thick uh, refret saw. I took it and I just kind of went in till I started seeing some sawdust. Because I wanted to get a feel for how thick this finish was. This little bead in the corner, it kind of pools up here when they spray it. And it's not too thick. Not nearly as thick. So I just want to get a feel for when I'm all the way through it. There's been an unsuspected substance identified here, and it's a dark colored binding material like celluloid plastic. And I don't know why it would be here on the other side of the white celluloid binding. There's a black piece. I'm trying to saw through it. And I can smell that it is plastic. It smells like PVC, whatever. Anyways, I don't know why it would be sandwiched in there. Next, it's time to heat the fretboard extension. I've got magnets and steel, both sides, to protect the spruce. Now we'll heat the rosewood. 12 minutes, I'll set a timer. And this is where we'll talk about patience. Um, I don't know about you guys, but while I'm waiting for the timer to go, I usually do some like standing ab exercises. It's good for the lower back. I keep in shape. 12 minutes. Put a little acetone over here and uh, Wanted to just see, because like I was telling you, this uh, contact cement dissolves in acetone. I wonder if those Taiwanese folks were just crazy enough to use that inside of the dovetail pocket where the neck is held onto the body. That'd be nutso. Rubber glue, contact cement, rubber cement. Easy. No, but the stuff that was inside of that Taiwanese FG331, I call it Godzilla glue. It was green, and it was rock hard as a crystal when it was cool. But when it was hot, it was like silicone. So I think that's the uh, green epoxy that uh, folklore has warned us all about. 
I steam I had to steam it for a while to get it off but so getting this in you really have to aim upward to get it in between the spruce and the rosewood and once you do get it in between I got it in and uh, it was so much work probably three times as much work as doing a Gibson or a Martin So this is mylar. This is the shape of the dovetail, supposedly. And what I want to do is I want to drill holes closer, close to the corner over here. I want to drill one big hole right in the middle here. Then I want to drill two small holes off to, to the edge over here. So one, two, three, four, five holes just feel around and see what, what we find. Found a nice big pocket bit down over here. So we can I think I'm drilling into solid wood there. This this hits the pocket. There's definitely a pocket back here, which is nice. But over here, I'm just drilling into wood over here. So I kind of I was getting ready to drill a big hole for my Stumac heat stick, but I kept hitting this metal. I kept hitting the end of the truss rod down in the pocket there. I don't know why it's protruding out into the pocket so far, but it is. So I don't want to break my drill bit and or you know have something down in there getting in my way. So I'm just gonna go with these little skinny guys for starters. They seem to go past that metal object. You could really hear it when the drill was spinning. You could hear it go click, 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 click. It was hitting that. And you know, I've got boiling hot water in this syringe here. I'm gonna get a little bit in. Should have a towel. Anyways, hoping I can get uh, get this water to seep down into this dovetail. Three, three for the price of two. I don't know what all this stress stuff is going on over here. I haven't even pulled or tugged on it yet. But it's already looking like it's coming loose. Up at the top anyhow. Which is excellent. A couple more minutes and I'll uh, put it in the neck removal jig. A little 
stress mark. So weird. So weird. Little update here. I couldn't get it off the first attempt. So now I'm dr drilling another hole a little bit closer in. And I'm finding out that closer in this way, to the, towards center. That this is all glue right here. In between the cheeks and the body, there is glue. So I'm going to keep drilling this out so I can get my heat probe in here. And uh, this might just be the moment that it releases. See a little crack or a little opening under the fingerboard extension. getting bigger. But it's not easy. I ended up using the Stumac heat stick after all. After that hide glue warmed up and softened, I was able to drill that bigger hole and stick it on in there with those smaller ones. And I used a little bit of steam. I didn't film it, but I shot a little steam in there. And finally, here we go. I actually went around one more time around the heel with the X-Acto blade too and cut a little bit more. Okay. Oh lordy. Looks like hide glue. Well, you know what this means, guys. There will be a payday. <laughs> There's a lot of spruce on, on there. And we'll be looking at this more closely soon. Oh, dear. Lots of little stress lines in it. You'd normally think, hey, it would have been easier because this is hide glue. Hide glue's easy. Wrong. I guess it's easy if they don't use too much hide glue but they use a lot and it's killing me but I think everything's gonna be okay there it's not uh, the prettiest looking dovetail right now but we'll do some finish repairs on this cracked finish before we put it all back together. I don't know, maybe this isn't hide glue. I guess we could burn it and see what it smells like. Okay, I'm burning it. Is that high glue? Kind of smells like hair or bone burning. So I'm taking this uh, boiling hot water on a paper towel and let it soak into that bunch of spruce that got left onto the <clears throat> fretboard extension. And then I should be able to come in here with a razor blade and peel that right up in about half hour. After that, I'll try to set it back onto the, the body. Get my seam separator and my hair dryer out and warm this up. So I went around to uh, separate this piece. And thankfully, it came off in one piece. 
I'm gonna stick that back down onto the onto the top. Clean this up, throw this out. Before I fit the neck, I figured I'd glue in that maple patch that I was talking about. I use this stock. It is two millimeter maple stock, plain sawn stuff, headstock veneers, I think they call it on Amazon or eBay. Cheap stuff, but great stuff for uh, making a bridge plate overlay. I like to tighten it down with these soft touch pliers. Make sure it's really tight. And I just use Type Bond Original. I bloodied myself. I was in there sanding that, and there's that jagged edges from the uh, maple fiber and CA glue that I did the back set of pins. Anyways, also, I buffed this on the buffer. I sanded it with a 120 and 220, and then took it right out to the buffer, and I used my dirty guitar buffing wheel. <laughs> that was so easy. Didn't have to like go up to a thousand grit sandpaper or none of that funny stuff. Just 120, 220, and the buffer. I'm using an eighth inch upcut bit in my Dremel and the Stu Mac saddle slot routing jig. I'm gonna fit it with an eighth inch bone nut. Get the vacuum in here. Stumac sells this little vacuum kit now too. It's for cleaning key keyboards and whatever. It works real good in guitars. Clean up the bottom of this slot. And we'll be making a bridge. I'm making a saddle. This cut helps minimize the hump at the neck to body joint once the neck is glued back onto the body.
Okay, put it into the workstation and clamped it on down. Make sure that uh, the string spacing looks good. And check the action. And check the brake angle over this saddle. And it all looks good to me. So, if you haven't seen that before, that's just the thermoplastic piece that holds the tip of the heel tight against the body. Because after you put the string tension on it, it has a tendency to want to pull this way and give you a false reading on your action. But it looks good to me. I'm going to glue it up now. And this is up to full tension. Um, usually I put all six strings on it, but because this is a 12 string, I just figured I'd do the outside strings. And there you go. Okay, warmed up my surfaces with the hair dryer. Now I'm brushing on some hot hide glue. I'll do the same thing over by the body. Doesn't take a lot. I'm not going to glue the fingerboard extension down all the way. I'm just going to put a little bit right here because I might want to put in a spacer. Alright, so the neck goes in. I'm going to hold it in there with this one clamp. Got my thermoplastic. Can you see it here? I got this little call. It's going to be pushed right up against there. And that's my glue up. Man, am I glad this one's done. He owes me a lot of money. But no, I'm glad because I had to order these strings. He used these heavy damn gauge strings, 12 through 54. Heavy bottoms, jeez. Well, I'm glad this is a Yamaha because there's not a lot of guitars this old that can handle that heavy of a string. But these guitars are built like a tank. So finally, I got it. He tunes it to Dadgad too, which is good because that's kind of like tuning it to to E flat, which is where I'm at now. I figured on the way to Dad Get, I'd stop at E flat and play a couple Zeppelin tunes. And then another thing I did is I put in the K and K. So let's give that a listen. So I got plugged into the Marshall there. subscribing and hanging around. Have a great weekend. We'll catch you later.